Welcome, everyone. So um, it strikes me just before starting that uh, since we announced this presentation um, here in the United States, there have been a series of things that really challenge the, the sense of having hope for the world. Uh, for one thing, the uh, number of uh, deaths from COVID went over a million. Um, and then there's this threat to some of the rights that people are used to, uh, especially the rights of women to make decisions about their own bodies and their own lives. And that seems to be part of a wave of uh, a kind of a movement to take away pe people's rights, which I think is partly generated by the overwhelm overwhelming uncertainty in the world right now. Uh, and then just a few days ago, there was another in this long series of uh, mass shootings that happen uh, so regularly in the United States. Um, and every time it happens, you just feel this weight and this grief and this loss, which tends to undermine the sense of having uh, hopes for healing, for some, some kind of peaceful resolution to all the polarization in the world. So that's here. Since this event was announced, there's been a number of those kind of incidents that really challenge our capacity to have hope for the world and hope for uh, our fellow uh, humans. Um, so what I want to do is First of all, take hope through three stages. One, literal meanings of hope, psychological meanings of hope, and then mythological perspectives on hope. But I wanted to start with a few uh, quotes. Uh, this is uh, something Salman Rushdie wrote a long time ago. One of the things that has happened to us as a human race is to learn how certainty crumbles in our hands. We can no longer have a fixed certain view of anything, but our lives teach us who we are. So that was a prophetic statement by him a number of years ago. And this is another prophetic statement from uh, Thomas Beckett, um, excuse me, Samuel Beckett, uh, the Irish poet and playwright. This confusion is not my invention. It is all around us, and our only chance is to let it in, to open our eyes and see the mess. Then there will be new forms, and the forms will be of such a type that they admit the chaos and do not try to say that it is really something else. So that's back forecasting, that we're going to have to learn to look at the chaos that's happening. The word chaos means not just disorder, it means gaping abyss. And it's as if we are being dragged to the abyss by various events in life that now get broadcast throughout the world so that we are in a um, global condition that can border on despair and turn into despair at any moment. That's part of being alive right now. Um, and so there's this challenge to accept the mess, and I often think of it as the challenge to stand in the darkness, and I'll come back to that idea throughout the presentation. Um, but a little quote came to mind, or a statement. In losing the sense of the unseen, people have come to fear the unknown. And what I mean there, the unseen was a reference to all the things that are real, but are not measurable. You know, people used to see nature not just as a biological thing or an ecological thing, but as the living spirit, uh, the green garment of nature with spirit being unseen, but yet also somehow seen or recognized. And when we've lost that connection to nature, we've lost many interconnections in the world. And so people, I think, are more afraid of the unknown because we have lost the practice of being present with the unseen. Um, so one more statement in that direction. If we don't accept that we stand in the darkness of not knowing, we, might, we may find ourselves increasingly feeling hopeless. So I'm going to make this suggestion that following Beckett and to some degree Rushdie and many other poets, 
we're in the dark times and we have to learn how to stand, how to move, how to be, how to become ourselves in the dark times. So back to hope. So on a literal level, hope means an expectation of something desired. That's like a dictionary definition. Um, etymologically, hope is related to hop, uh, meaning looking forward and also leaping with expectation. Um, and so one of the ways to understand hope is that common hope has a lot of expectation in it. And that can be the cause of problems, as Shakespeare supposedly said. Um, expectation is the root of all heartache. So part of the problem of hope is unconscious or semi-conscious expectations, which then don't pan out, at which point we can fall into disappointment would be the first falling place. The next one could be hopelessness. Um, so another way to think about hope, um, literally, is that um, early hopes in life tend to be false hopes. They tend to be hopes that cannot stand up to reality. Like, I hope I can be the smartest person, or I hope I can be the richest person, or I hope, you know, those kind of hopes that are typical of uh, being young. Those hopes are intended to be dashed. And so that leads to the idea that part of hope is getting lost. And so I'm going to come at that several different ways. That is to say, hope is continually lost and then found. And what's meaningful is when it's found at a deeper level, a deeper layer of knowledge or understanding. So... Um, uh, some people, I'm, I'm looking for these statements that I gathered. Um, so you could say that people cling to naive hopes in order to avoid despair at any cost. And so there's an old idea that emotions and many important things travel in pairs. People tend to do that. And uh, hope travels with despair. Despair is uh, from the French, despere, and the middle of it, S-P-E-R, S-P-E-S, is hope. Despair is to be without hope. But despair travels with hope. Hope travels with despair. They're interchangeable in certain critical moments. I'll come back to that. But I'm thinking about that because some days I can feel uh, like I've lost hope. Uh, some days I feel like I'm in a lineage of people who use their lives uh, to make meaning, to make beauty, to serve justice. And in that mode, I feel hopeful about my life. I feel hopeful about humanity. And then the next day I find in the current world, I can feel like, wait a minute, all the people that went before us that served and sacrificed for meaningful things... Now, none of that seems to count anymore as the world loses substance in a sense and becomes more and more uh, meaningless. Um, so I find myself going in and out of hope, and that has me thinking about considering uh, the underlying nature of hope. Uh, and so that goes then to a psychological point or point of view. So... Um, um, just another statement. Where we place our trust is where we are likely to find despair. So, in other words, hoping for something means partially trusting that it will come, expecting that it will come, and then that's going to be the place where the hope gets lost, and then that's going to be the place where we have to face despair. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just read it again. Where we place our trust is where we hope and where we are likely to find despair. And, and one reason I'm saying that is where we find despair doesn't mean end of the story. It means a meaningful place to us. The place where we lose hope is a meaningful place. And I'll come around to how hope is refound. Um, and I'll just repeat, the concepts of hope and despair can be interchangeable. 
um, one can lead to the other. That tends to be what happens. And um, so although uh, despair means to be without hope, hope is hidden inside despair. So one of the really meaningful things in life is that people who lose all hope, who are in terrible circumstances of war, of famine, of all, all the things that human beings have to suffer, sometimes turn out to be the people that have the most hope. And that's because, in my imagination, what happens is they find the second level of hope. The first level of hope is hopefulness. It can be false hopes. It can be naive hopes. And when those are lost, if a person stays with themselves and following the statements early on, stands in the darkness, allows the dark time to bear fruit for them, then there's a second level of hope that is found. And that hope is not as naive and it's not as superficial and it's not easily lost. And that's the message that comes from people who have survived really hard times. It, traditionally, that's the case. And in modern times, you can find that as well. I personally have found more hope in working with people who are refugees, working with people in prisons, working with people that live homeless on the street. Strangely, when you find hope there, it's that second level of hope. And I'm suggesting that the second level of hope is connected to imagination. And I'll keep coming back to that. So um, uh, I want to move to the mythological. And one of the places that we find hope mythologically is in the story of Pandora, often referred to as Pandora's box. But right from the beginning, it's important, I think, to know the original story was had no box in it. Um, it's a really ancient story. And so um, instead of a box, what was there was more like an urn, like an earthen jar. As a matter of fact, uh, the name Pandora means all gifted and all giving. Those are meanings of that word. Um, and so, and then Pandora was originally an earth goddess. And so she, in the myths, she was formed from earth and water, from clay and water, from mud. She's made from the earth. She's, in some myths, she's the first woman. Uh, she's the archetype of woman, you could say. Um, and so she's related to the earth, and so she doesn't have a box. That idea was inserted much later on. Um, she has an urn. And so it used to be that uh, ancient farming communities in, in, in Greece, where the story of Pandora comes from, and other areas, um, in, uh, in order to preserve the grains that they grew and the oils that they made also, they would put them in big earthen jars. And if it happened in the course of a cold winter that someone died and the ground was frozen and they couldn't do a proper burial, they would put the deceased person in one of those urns also. Um, and uh, so, in, a, in other words, the urns that held the grains that provided life could also turn into funerary urns. And that all relates to the idea of the earth goddess as well because the earth goddesses are... Um, the mistresses of the womb and the tomb. And people used to know that the earth is the place of birth and the place of burial. And that's the sign of the deep feminine as well. And Pandora was part of that mystery and history. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so then um, in, in the story of Pandora, another thing that people get wrong is that she gets blamed for opening the lid on the box, which is in a box, uh, and that released all of the terrible things, the famines and the pestilence and the terrors and the dangers and the horrors that were contained in the original container. Um, she's blamed with doing that, but that's not the story either. The original story is, for some strange reason, Pandora, this earth goddess, the source of all gifts and all giving, marries... Epimetheus, who is the brother of Prometheus. And Prometheus means far-sighted, seeing ahead. And Prometheus, Prometheus of course, is the, uh, the character who foresaw 
that humans would need fire to make culture, so he stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans. His brother Epimetheus, that name means uh, unable to see ahead and only able to see what happens after it has occurred, or it also means short-sighted, and Pandora, maybe out of the great irony of existence, winds up marrying Epimetheus, the short-sighted one, the one who only can recognize what happens after it occurs, and he's the one who lifts the lid on the jar that's not a box that releases all of the terrors and all of the dramas and all of the tragedies into the world. So that's the oldest story that I can find about it. But the only thing that's left after everything has been released into the world, all of the bad things, so to speak, all of the unbearable things even, the only thing that's left under the lid is hope. And so it's from that idea or from that image that I got the idea of a second kind of hope that's there after the despair, that's there after the tragedies, after the terrors, after the sufferings, and after the losses, and after the confusion, because it seems like that's what we're living in now, like someone has lifted the lid, and and you could call it um, the uh, return of the repressed, the repressed hatreds, the repressed vengeances, the repressed fears, the repressed agonies, it's like it's all poured back into the world, and according to the story, there should be, there could be, after that happens, or in the midst of that happening, hope. This second kind of hope, at least the kind I'm referring to, the deeper sense of hope, not the false hope, not the naive hope, but a f hope that's found after facing despair. Going back to Beckett saying we have to face it. Then the forms come, and one of those forms could be the second level uh, of hope. And so... Um, I guess I'm thinking of another thing, which is there were, there's this old idea of the three kinds of people. And the first kind of purple person is the um, it's all about me person. You know, I'm the most important thing. And what happens to me is only what counts. Uh, and therefore, I deserve to have everything I want. And I'm, I deserve to be given if everything I claim I need. That's the first kind of person. The second kind of person realizes that there are other people in the world and that maybe it's a better world when I can recognize the needs of others and we can learn how to communicate and how to share. And so there's a lot of people that wake up to that second idea. How can we get along? How can we cooperate? How can we build um, civil society where everybody has some chance and everybody is served uh, just as the earth gives to everyone? And, um, and so that's a great thing. But under pressure, what tends to happen when the pressure comes down on that second group of people, the group of people who have the win-win idea, the people who have the sense of cooperation, often people begin to forget that and let go of that and convert back into the first kind of person who say it's all me and it's all about me. Uh, and I think that's another thing that we're experiencing in the world where the extremes of politics are really um, the politics of grievance. That's number one person. It's all me, and it's about me. And when we see people in that state and we know they're kind of unreachable, that causes us to lose hope in, in, in humanity and in the world. And that's what's going on now. There's a third kind of people, according to this, this old understanding, and those are the ones who have lost hope and who have found themselves dwelling in darkness and in despair. And in that darkness, they get a vision that, according to the old principles, comes from the core of their own being, from the depth of their own heart. And that awakened inner vision is like the second level of hope, the coming back of hope that's tied to genuine vision and tied to a deep sense of being and ties to a ground of understanding not standing up on top insisting on what's mine and not in the middle fighting over who's right and who's wrong but understanding standing under in the darkness in the roots down in the beginning uh i say down in the beginning because in the psyche down and back are the same as we go down deeper we go back closer to origins and uh, and so in all of the old philosophies and many of the old stories, each person is born with a core imagination 
that makes them unique, that is in their heart, and that has a gradient line, an unfolding plot line that is intended to lead them through life. And when it becomes a dark times, and in those times when we have lost hope, and we cannot find the light in the darkness right away, we're supposed to follow that inner gradient. And then the soul gives us what we can't find in the outside world. And so I think we're in that condition collectively. That is to say, it's very hard to find hope in the outside world right now. It's often hard to find meaning in the outside world right now. And so therefore we have to turn and find it within. But if we turn within and we're having that period or that day or that year where we're feeling hopeless, we can feel that despairing of any meaning in the world and The old stories say, and the story of Pandora says, underneath those feelings of loss and distortion and fear and anguish, there's another kind of hope that has to do with vision and has to do with the deep core imagination of each person's soul. And when we can tap into that, then we have something to bring back and we have something to stay connected to. And we get maybe more used to the idea of losing hope and then finding another piece of vision or something of that kind. I think we have are being invited to the edge of the abyss right now. And that means uh, losing hope at times. Um, and then, so there's another idea, which I like a lot, which is created or creative disorder. That is to say, we're educated to think that everything should be okay, and things should be going along smoothly, and things should be progressing. You know, the big idea of progress, especially in the West, Western world, um, and that's not working anymore. Um, but in creations, in the story of creation and creation myths, you have chaos at the beginning and then you have chaos at the end. And so we're in kind of that chaotic darkness, that time of chaos that feels like the end, but also is secretly the beginning of the next vision of the world, you could say. And on a personal level, the more we can tolerate um, the darkness, the uncertainty, the not knowing, uh, the more likely that we actually find the light hidden in the dark, the deep intelligence, the deep illumination of our own soul. And along with that comes a vision and a closer connection to aligning with the story trying to unfold from within us. So that's the first maybe view of, uh, of hope and its connection to imagination and I see that there are questions, so I'll go to questions. First one, <clears throat> I struggle with hope, not because I can't imagine there can be a better future, but because hope seems to take me out of the present. Can you speak about the relationship between accepting what is and hoping for something better? Thank you, good question. So what I'm, I'm trying to say, there's a deeper kind of hope that is not expectation of the future. Um, we have been educated to think that hope is about uh, what I expect or what I project into the future. And the story of Pandora says that hope is what's left after everything has become dark and confusion and all the pains and all the problems of our personal life, but nowadays we could say the whole world, have been released. So it's a matter of um, not... Mm. needing to see hope as predictive of the future, but finding the hope in the moment as an awakening of one's own vision. I hope that's helpful. It's a good question. And I'm trying to say through this whole uh, um, presentation that we've been given the wrong idea about hope. Um, Hope is not faith. Faith is a belief that something good is going to happen Um, And hope is often confused with that, but in stories, hope can be a deeper thing. Um, So how do we um, let go of fixed ideas about a better future and not lose hope is, I guess, what I'm trying to say, Um, that there's a hidden hope. So it's a refinement there. I hope that's helpful. 
but it'll keep coming back as well. I understand earth as the place of burial. Can you speak to earth as the place of birth? Yes, thank you. Um, the earth thanks you. Uh, earth is the place of birth of every plant you've ever seen, of every tree you've ever passed, um, of every herb you've ever used, and so on and so forth. Earth is the, um, the core energy, abundant core energy of, uh, of life, the constant giving of life and birthing of life from the earth. Um, and so, and then in cosmology, you know, in cosmology, you have the four or five. I like the idea that there's five elements, you know, and it's uh, fire, water, earth, uh, mineral, and nature. That would be West African cosmology. And earth is in the middle, especially for us earthlings. So the earth as an element in alchemy, in cosmology, is the source of birth, the source of renewal, the source of the energy of creation. So in when you get away from monotheistic religions and, and, and you get away from Bible stories, um, the divine, the gods, if you want, don't leave the earth after they create the earth. They stay in the earth. And so I'm mentioning uh, Pandora as a goddess of the earth. Um, in other words, the divine earth mother is still in the earth, still giving birth to the world day after day. Creation isn't something that happened way back then and we're in some kind of aftermath. Uh, we might be in the afterglow, but creation is ongoing, ongoing on the earth. Um, and so um, another modern idea is takes the divine, takes the creative energy out of the earth and that allows this massive exploitation of the earth, this tremendous discounting of earth energy. And as we lose that connection to the earth as the kind of ground mystery of birth and death, um, what happens is we wind up with the simply materialistic world and we wind up in a battle over things that don't really count. So another way to understand what we're living through is um, the painful, it seems tragic path needed in order to re-encounter collectively the mystery of life. And the mystery of life was always known to be birth, death, renewal. Life, death, rebirth. And the earth was the classic source of that. Um, so I hope that helps with that. Where, the, where does the vision come from in the darkness of despair? Okay, thank you. Despair, despere, loss of hope. Um, here's a way that people know about it. The dark night of the soul. So a person loses those they love, loses the career, loses um, their health, all those things that happen to people. And we're thrown, um, the ancient people would think we were thrown into the underworld, into Hades, or you could say the dark night of the soul. And we no longer see a path. We don't see a way. And so our eyes are closed or we're blind. In initiation rites, the initiates would be blindfolded in order to let go of how they saw the world and what they expected. And so they go into a, a period of not seeing and not knowing. We are those initiates now, a whole collective of people, global initiates, walking in the dark. And so then it turns out there's another set of eyes. This is an old idea. Everybody's born with, most people born with the eyes that open upon birth. And those eyes see into the world, see into the literal world, see by the daylight of the world. And then awakening in a deeper way, initiation was an old term for it, opens the eyes of the soul. And the eyes of the soul already know where we're supposed to be going. They have, the eyes of the soul have the vision of our life. And we're secretly here to awaken to the purpose and the vision set within our souls. And the only way I can see that we get out of this darkness and out of this, you know, anguish condition that we're in, in terms of the unraveling of nature and the kind of collapsing of culture, 
is we each find this vision that we came to the world with when we were born with a vision inside and we find that path that makes meaning and makes purpose in our lives and in that way we bring legitimate living hope back into the world. That's how, where I'm trying to come from. Um, could you please speak to the distinction between hope and faith? Which do you feel serves us more in this time? Well, I just think they're two diff different things. Um, most, when I hear faith, I hear fixed faith. And, and I mean faith as a, uh, as a system, as a belief system. And so when you see faith as a belief system, I was raised as a Catholic, so I'm a recovery Catholic. Um, and as a child, I was given fixed belief and told that this is the faith that, that you have to have, and this is what you gets you into heaven at the end of life. Uh, and notice, heaven is separate from the earth. And that begins this separation of understanding our actually dwelling place, the earth. Uh, but anyway, faith is like fixed belief that something is so, and it will be so in the future. And hope typically is understood as simplistic form of hope, expectation of the future. I'm saying there's a deeper level of hope, which is vision of the future that makes sense to my soul or to our souls. And so that's the distinction that I see, um, which is better. I'm, I'm not big on faith right now. In, insofar as faith is a fixed belief, I think we're living in the time when things are upside down and beliefs have to be reconsidered. Um, or what I like to say, we're standing in the dark. And in the dark, we need vision, not faith. Um, what is the best thing to do for oneself in the depths of despair? Just hang on, sink into it, open to it. Is there anything else one can do uh, to bring about an experience of this new kind of hope? Uh, yes, I would say you figure out what to hang on to and you let go of a lot. Um, and definitely sinking into. The, the idea is deepening. Um, so I'll give this quick example. So when I was 20 years old, long story short, I wound up in solitary confinement in a military prison for refusing to go to Vietnam War, da da da. Uh, in that prison, well, I wasn't a good prisoner. Um, I wasn't good at following orders at all. I still not, still not really, but, um, but anyway, so I wound up in solitary confinement. Now I'm 20 years old, I'm in a very small cell and uh, I don't see anybody day or night. The nights are really dark. There's very little light. I could barely see light coming in from a, dish, a little window down the hall. I'm living alone in darkness. And I went through layers of despair. I mean, it gets to the point where this is not about my family or how I was brought up. This is not about the future or anything I expected. I did not expect to be all alone, isolated in darkness. And then the most amazing, and I had to accept it. Eventually I had to accept it. And then something happened. I started to get visions and I also started to get what seemed like visitors showing up in my solitary confinement and they were characters from mythology, characters from stories that I had been loved and been moved by. And I had this moment where I had to decide, am I losing my mind or am I finding my mind? The ancient de definition of mind is the poetic unity of a person. And I was finding that mind, that deeper mind, that mind that was connected to meaning for me and that mind that was became connected to vision. And from that moment, in a roundabout way with interruptions and losses of, of direction and disorientation, I wind up where I am now a, a, a student of mythology, a storyteller, and someone who likes to talk about myth. And that came from everything being lost and darkness being the defining element and me having nothing to turn to except something that was deep inside myself that no one even had told me was there, but it showed up. So maybe that's a little talk about faith, a little bit the faith that... so. 
one of the problems in the modern world that makes things seem hopeless and meaningless is most people don't know that each person comes into the world already imbued, already carrying gifts that are intended to give, be given and already carrying, carrying inside their heart a core image, an imagination that's waiting to blossom and come forth. And so when we are all alone, when we've lost everything, we are lost, but we haven't lost who we are in our essence. And that's the story you hear from people who survive despairing experiences. Um, and I'm suggesting that we're going through a collective rite of passage that has this period and this condition of people feeling like we're lost in the darkness. And I think COVID has brought that to people as well. And I think in that sense, it's not simply a biological you know, disease. It's also a sign of what we're going through, um, a symbol of the period we're in. You talked about the third person who is dealing with hopelessness and then finds a deeper level of hope. Can you speak more on how to help someone or yourself make it past hopelessness to get and, and not get stuck in, in that hopelessness to get to a deeper level of hope. How do we know that we've made it to that deeper level? Uh, it's, so here's the trouble with, you know, with the process of becoming. Each person is unique, and it tends to be that the steps that they take in order to awaken are unique also. I'm not a big person on steps, you know, like, you know, you can always lay out the five steps or seven steps or 12 steps. Uh, but there's also a thing called a pathless path. And on any path, a person hits that place. You can't see the steps. That's part of what's happening in hopelessness and despair. I can no longer see the steps. And so then it's going to come from this deeper place. I mean, I can only say this because I've experienced it. And then I've worked with, you know, severely at risk youth. I've worked with refugees. I've worked with people in prisons, people already convicted and, and in prison for life. And that's it. But it isn't it because this is inner life and each inner life is unique. And each inner life has this potential for awakening that's intended to be experienced. And so it's hard to show it. It's, it's more like pointing that that's the case. And so one, one way to consider one's own life, if this doesn't seem clear, like I have that clear marker. If you take away the idea of me as a 20 year old uh, in solitary confinement for months and then not eating on top of that, then I'm gone too. Because that, uh, as people, Native Americans say, that ritual made me. Well, that ritual of imprisonment made me. Um, and something in us is trying to make us awaken to who we are. And, um, and there comes the moment where we have to trust that. Contemporary world, there's no guarantee that people figure this stuff out very soon. The political stuff may remain polarized. The people who want to enforce a kind of autocratic state in order to be relieved of the pressure of uncertainty and not knowing may continue in that path. Things may get darker. And so what do we have when the outside world doesn't make sense? The deeper sense is waiting to be found inside ourselves. And then how do we change? How does the world change? Um, the old saying is, no change at the level of the soul, no change at the level of the world. And it doesn't mean, mean we have to become heroic and all that. That's part of the problem. The idea now is if more people would awaken and get some sense of this inner purpose, some sense of a vision that makes their life meaningful, the more people that begin to do that, that begins to change the conditions of the world without anybody being in charge of it all. Um, and that, I would say, begins to bring the second level of hope into being, into existence. And then we sometimes... Hope comes from seeing someone else wake up. That can awaken the hope in us. And so I'm just trying to point to this territory um, that to me is mythologically very clear. Um, and, you know, when nothing else meant, makes sense, myth can make the most sense. 
Would you say that the chaos today strips away our mental notions and forces us to live from the heart and thus to draw on source rather than ideas of what should be? I would say yes, but, but, um, uh, men mentality has been distorted. It's not something we should be rid of. And here's a weird old idea that I love. There's an old idea that says there's a thought in the heart that's trying to think us forward. And, and then associated idea, um, there are feelings inside thoughts. What's happened is the two have become distorted because of the exaggeration of object, subject, object difference, you know, in a sense. Um, and that's what forced the mind and the heart apart. Um, so we actually need good ideas that can be coming from the heart. Um, and we need, obviously, feelings as well. Just as hope and despair operate together and are paradoxical, it's true also with thoughts and feelings. Um, and so, yes, we need more heart. We need more uh, heartfulness. We need more living from the heart and living wholeheartedly. Um, you know, we do need that. And then, in order to change how things are shaped and how society works, we need profoundly good ideas. And many of the best ideas come from dreams. And so, um, once we get away from the kind of uh, more modern, exaggerated uh, rationality of subject and object, then we could find that thought and feeling, that depth of heart and awakening of mind go together. Uh, would it be fair to say that the chaos, oh, that's where we just were. This makes me think of the initiatory dismemberment could it be that the deeper level of hope you're talking about is a pathway to remembering? Yes. So in this depth that I'm talking about, where the second layer of hope is, there's other things that are there in terms of mythology, for instance. Um, and, and so uh, one of them is great memory. And now, um, and we're back, we're in this goddess territory sometimes, which has been, you know, more or less forgotten about waiting to be remembered. Um, and down in the underworld, which on a psychological level you could call the unconscious, um, down there, um, for instance, in ancient Greek mythology, you have two rivers. The river Lethe. Lethe is the Greek word for forgetting. The river of forgetfulness, it's called. The river of unmindfulness was another name that it had. And then you have the other river, the river Nemesine. Nemesine is the goddess from whom we get the word memory, the river of deep memory. And so if you descend into the underworld, you find those two rivers there, those two streams uh, of, uh, that are opposite streams. And so, yes, I think we're being pushed into a darkness um, which can lead some people to forgetting more and more. People are forgetting what humanity is right now. On the other hand, those of us who recognize or can see with those eyes from inside can find the river of deep memory. And Nemesine, the goddess of memory, is, this, is not this simple memory like human memory. It's the ancient memory. It's the river of memory flowing from the origins of everything. And when we find that, we can tap all the way back to the origins. And in mythology, that's meaningful because when we tap the origins, we're tapping the place of potential and we can renew the vitality of our lives and possibly contribute to the renewal of the vitality of the earth as well. And just to mention, in terms of memory, um, Nemesine, goddess of memory, her daughters were the muses. And so when we tap into those ancient memories, the kind of connections to origin, which are part of our inheritance, even though the modern world has forgotten that. It's as if we've fallen under a big cloud of forgetting. But what's waiting to be remembered is that deep memory and Nemesine, the daughter, her daughters are the muses, and they're the source of music. Museum means place of the muses. Amusing comes from them. And that, so that is to say that when we tap into the well of memory, 
we activate the arts and the music and the creative energies and we reconnect to the muses who are trying to give us um, you know, brilliant ideas as well as good lyrics, as well as uh, amusing ideas as well. So that's all being waited, waiting to be found, but in the old myths it was found by going down, not by climbing up. Okay, so going down, I'll just continue a little bit, we'll come back to questions. <clears throat> So the core power of humanity is not simple hope, but a capacity for renewal that attends the natural powers of imagination in the soul. The old idea was imagination is the deepest power of the soul. Humans have this amazing capacity to imagine. And the old, another old idea was nothing exists until it has first been imagined. So this next world that is needed the old world's already gone. I mean, some people are holding on to it, but basically it's gone. And, and we're in the kind of liminal space between, between the end of one worldview and the beginning of another, the end of one era and the beginning of another, because in the mythological realm, the end is connected to the beginning. And so things don't simply come to an end. As a matter of fact, the word end doesn't mean finality over and done. End really means a remnant, a loose end. And from the loose ends of what used to be the world, the next world is made by mixing in with the creative energy of the earth and nature, but also the creative energy that can come through people. And so, um, so in that sense, going back to the story of Pandora, uh, the issue isn't so much thinking out of the box, as people like to say, uh, as much as revealing the core imagination that's inside each life story. And I want to repeat, so the idea of being hopeless or being in despair is meaningful because each person is meaningful because each person carries meaning waiting to be awakened. Um, and so I'm not with the people that say, maybe it's time for nature to be finished with humans. I think that's a very bad, not just... Uh, cynical, that's a nihilistic idea that comes out of misunderstanding hopelessness. Um, humans are, used to be called, links in the chain of being. You take humans out and the chain of being now begins to be frayed and broken. It's not that. It's not what that we've come to the end of humanity. My sense, or where I find hope, is if we as humans have been able to do so much damage that we've caused the ecosystems to start to unravel and we've turned you know, human society and culture upside down, if we can do that much damage, then by the laws of balance and justice, we should be able to rectify that or, or contribute to the rectifying of that. That our capacity to, to destroy in terms of Myths of creation have to be connected to a capacity to contribute to creation. And I think that's what we're being asked to do. But the capacity in us that's truly creative is not superficial, it's deep. And we have to be somehow our ego mm, kind of obsessions have to be broken. And we have to be as initiates were wearing blindfolds or walking blind or in initiations, people used to be, uh, they used to act as if they were dead. In other words, the simplistic life of that first kind of person, it's all about me, has to kind of die so that this deeper life can be born. And then the hope, not naive, not false, but a genuine imaginative hope comes back with the awakening of the initiate. That's another way to say it. Um, so, um, Genuine hope points beyond oneself. I was saying at the beginning, I was mentioning naive hopes and, and, and false hopes, you know, like the hopes you have in high school, that, you know, I could be the fastest one or the strongest one or the smartest one. You know, those tend to be naive and they tend to be simply about oneself. Genuine hope points to something beyond oneself so that when, when that kind of hope is present, it's more aligned with the person's purpose. And the purpose of each person goes beyond them actually to be 
straightforward about it, goes back to the divine. Humans are here stretched between the goat's earth, as they used to say, and the stars of the heaven. We are pulled between, you know, the highest imagination, just as we are pulled into the deepest feelings. We are that being that is stretched that way. And we are aimed at something profound, each one of us, even though many people don't know that. The rule has to be that everybody Everyone comes in with purpose, with a capacity for imagination and a vision waiting to awaken. That's why there's such a thing as calling. And we're here to awaken to that. Uh, but we cannot do that until we have been dipped into darkness and, and be essentially stripped down enough to let go of the things that are blocking our way of finding vision. Um, so from the second layer level of hope, uh, we get what used to be called a darker knowledge. One of the old Greek words for wisdom was dark knowledge. That is to say, wisdom includes knowledge of the darkness as well as knowledge of the light. Um, and it also includes insight into one's own soul. And so dark night of the soul, dark times on, on the earth are the times when we learn the nature of our own souls. And we have to learn to trust that because the outside world is not going to be stable for a very long time, it looks like. Um, so people, that old saying, hope springs eternal. I like it, but the way it seems to me, hope springs eternal when we the, allow the eternal to touch us. Um, again, the ancient world um, the, the notion was that the divine, the eternal, is present nearby. William Blake had that wonderful saying, um, um, each day has a moment of eternity waiting for you. Now, that's a hopeful statement. Each day has a moment of eternity waiting, waiting for you, waiting for each one of us. Um, that's the delivery system of the divine, uh, that we're intended to, to be connected to eternal things, things of great meaning and great duration. Um, and we're invited to have that experience at least once a day. Now there, that's going to generate that kind of deep hope, not a foolish hope that it's all going to work out fine and it's going to happen soon, but that deep sense of hope that is connected back to the story of Pandora, connected to the earth itself. Um, so I'm also connecting this con the concerns about hope to the dynamic of chaos and creation. Um, to me, we're living in not just mythic times again, we're living in creation times, especially because in all mythologies that I've been able to find, chaos and creation come together. As a matter of fact, chaos, which can mean eternal darkness or um, gaping abyss, um, uh, is usually characterized in stories as the endless dark ocean to give it an image, but it's called also the void. Um, but it's the pregnant void. Everything that comes into creation is hidden in the darkness before it becomes evident. And so when we find ourselves in the darkness, mythologically speaking, we're closer to creation. I think there's hope in that, not simple hope, not it gets better right away, uh, and everything turns out fine, not that way, creatively, creatively. So um, one of the old terms um, for what I think people are feeling, uh, and it gets confused with, with hopelessness, is foreboding. So just as hope is like leaning forward with expectation. There's this idea of foreboding, which is having a vision or a fearful vision, um, you know, that really bad things are going to happen. And I think a lot of people are living in foreboding now. Um, and um, in, in other words, living it with fear of utter collapse or utter loss or utter disorientation. And I think that's being referred to as loss of hope. Um, to me, it's helpful to distinguish that. Um, the idea that when I say standing in the dark, that means not leaning into the foreboding too much. In the dark night of the soul, you can't see what's coming. 
but the whole idea of the soul's dark night is that the darkness is pregnant and it's pregnant with who we are at the core of ourselves and that's what's trying to awaken in mythology the obstacles that happen in a person in, in a story a life story a person's story are not there simply to stop us they're there to push us deeper into ourselves with the understanding that everybody is full of meaning deep inside that everybody's bringing gifts that the world needs that everybody is here on the path of awakening even the people who who deny there is such a path so sticking with myth for a minute and um kind of opening up the idea of the spirit of hope so there's another maybe this connects to faith i don't know but there was an old term the spirit of hope and and so the hope that's left under the lid after not pandora but epimetheus lifts the lid and all the terrible things in inside the jar come out um that was called the spirit of hope that hope and um so um first of all implication the spirit of hope comes out when all the darkness occurs and everything has been lost and turned into um anguish um but in pre-roman italy in the mythology that was natural to the people before roman empire um the spirit of hope was called elpis e l p i s uh although she was also called spes s p e s and you can see from spes it goes to spur and that becomes the french despair out out of uh out of hope uh but out of connection to the spirit of hope out of connection to elpis uh so to me this is interesting because it gives this deeper sense of things um so elpis the spirit of hope was not officially a goddess more like what the greeks called a daimon a natural spirit um and she was connected to expectations and suffering as if there was this old understanding of the simple ideas of hope are connected to expectations and that leads to suffering um and so uh but elpis this to me this is very interesting was the daughter of nyx nyx who was the goddess of night um so at the beginning of creation in in this goes back to pre-roman and greek myths that in the beginning was the eternal darkness called nyx she's the mother of the spirit of hope called elpis and then in some of the stories elpis has a brother whose name is moros m o r o s which gives us our word morosity or morose feeling morose and so elpis the spirit of hope comes into the world with a twin companion of uh that which is morose and so the complexities and the paradoxical nature of hope is in the, in that story or it seems to me it's shown in that story um and nyx the goddess of night is also called uh she herself is the daughter of chaos so i'm trying to say the chaos in the world um that causes hopelessness is also the energy that originally gave birth to darkness that gave birth to real the spirit of hope roundabout way of saying when hope is lost you find it again in the darkness um even in the chaos and so then another way i'm talking about that second level of hope i call it active hope not that simplistic hope that it's going to turn out right but the hope that comes alive in a person from being actively part of their own internal meaning and part of their tr- living their calling or living their purpose then hope will be there as an active element not as simple hopefulness i hope that makes sense now and and people that are in that mode actively responding to the calling feeling connected to their own internal gradient 
um, somehow struggling with the gifts that they've been given, figuring out how to live with them and how to give them. Hope is there without even, even being referred to. The spirit of hope is there. And so I'm trying to suggest that that's what we want to recover. Not a hope about the future, but the hope that's active in our life when our life is actively aimed and being worked towards a meaningful purpose. And then I'm adding to that, when we're living with meaningful purpose, we're affecting the world in ways that provides hope for other people and provides generativity um, and renewal to the world. Not that we're in charge of it. We add our little bit. If other people do that, it starts to happen on a scale. And people don't even have to have agreements about it. It just happens. Um, so a couple more statements about that. Um, the second level and the deeper meaning of hope depends upon the power uh, of imagination in the soul and the capacity of each soul to renew itself and add to the renewal of life. Um, mythologically, the end is the beginning. The end of one era is the, you get a renewal of life going to the next. I often tell this old Native American tale about the old woman who weaves the world and then the, her dog unravels this beautiful weaving, which is the world, and she has to stand there or sit there and face all the work that she put into making the most beautiful thing that ever was is now unraveled into a chaotic mess on the floor and she just sits she's in the cave, the cave of knowledge. Um, and so she's sitting in that darkness, in that kind of chaos, in that, and she maybe feels hopeless, I don't know. The story doesn't tell you. It just says that after a while, she saw a loose thread amongst the chaos of threads that represented the unraveling of the world. And when she picked up that loose thread, she got a vision of the next garment that was even more beautiful, and she began to weave the world again. You could call that the second level of hope that is connected to vision. We could call that the return of the spirit of hope that comes back with a vision that is worth being followed. I think we're in that place. We are the witnesses of the collapse, and we are those being invited to contribute to the reweaving, the remaking, the reimagining, the revitalizing of the world. Um, it doesn't mean everything turns out okay. Uh, you know, it turns out that the point isn't to happily live happily ever after, it's to live a life of meaning. Um, and so uh, I see that there's more questions. I'll stop there. Does discovering the second level of hope relate to grieving? Another good question. Yes. Yes. You know? Um, so if, we, if we're going to say there's a trio, hope, despair, and maybe between those is grieving. Um, you know, grieving is the natural, human, emotional response to loss. And amongst the things that have been lost in the world that are trying to be remembered is that when we lose something, we allow ourselves to go into grief. And since each emotion has emotion, has a motion, the motion of grief is to wash out that which no longer has life. And so we, we grieve for those who have died, but we also naturally would grieve for whatever we lose as aspects of our own life. And so um, grieving is part of what's denied by the insistence on light and bright in the world. You know, there's a denial of night for ancient people. Imagine people living and telling time by a sundial. The sun gives you a sense of the passing hours until sundown and then the sundial stops working, and everyone knew that eternity came back. And people used to live in darkness, understanding darkness was part of creation. And, uh, and I think people also naturally at times live closer to grief than is happening in the modern world. And grief and the process of grief and the learning that comes from grief and the connections and the empathy that comes from grief or what are another thing waiting to be remembered. Thank you. You say we are closer to creation when we are in the darkness. 
Being in the darkness for some people may mean that they hate their life and want to end it. If one were to awaken and have truly been transformed, then will the darkness of those dark thoughts be gone? It's, a, it's an important question. Thank you. Um, it, there's no promises. You can't promise how that comes out. But, um, okay, how do we take this apart? Um, hating one's life is the darkness. Um, everyone naturally has self-loathing. That's a natural part of being human. Um, uh, and when we hate our own life, it means we haven't found our own life. Something was taken from us that would have been a closer connection to who we actually are. And so one of the ideas about taking one's life uh, in working with um, suicidal youth uh, and friends of those who have committed suicide, it became important to know how to talk to them about those things. And one thing that I would say to them is the feeling that you want to die or, or kill yourself or that you hate yourself is not about you dying completely. It's about the part of you that you can't live with dying so that the rest of you can live. And that's exactly the idea that what used to be in the old process of rites of passage. Um, the initiate would be acting as dead for a while, indicating there are parts of us that have to die for the rest of us to live. Birth, death, rebirth. That's the mystery behind it all. And so um, part of what's missing in the modern world is at the end of childhood, there, the psyche really expects a rite of passage that says, I'm no longer a child. I'm stepping away from that world. How do I step into the next world? And, um, and two things had to happen. Uh, one, a person needed to find a vision of the rest of their life. That was part of, that's what vision quest really is about. But the other thing that had to happen is the anguish or the pain or the wounds of a person had to be opened. That's why in, in initiation rites, a person would receive a wound, not to hurt them, but to remind them they could touch their body and feel that, the scar of that wound and remember that they were wounded. And, and so the idea of this self-hate and not wanting to live would usually be engaged as a youthful rite of passage so that the adult person is not someone who has never suffered, not someone who has never symbolically died, not someone who has never felt grief, not someone who has never been in a dark night of the soul, but the exact opposite, the awakened, awakened person, or they call it adult, would be someone who has gone through that and has found aspects of themselves that are part of this core imagination in the heart, and also found some gifts that are natural to them that are the balance to the wounds. And so part of the problem of being in the modern world is we're in societies that don't know anything about rite of passage, and people are left on their own, and that feels overwhelming and easily hope, hopeful, hopeless. Um, and so to answer the end of the question, um, when that kind of transformation occurs, are the dark thoughts gone? Mostly I would say yes, because what's learned about is death and rebirth. So then the idea is you don't go through initiation once. Every meaningful turn or crossroads in life turns out to be another initiatory step. And so later in life, we go through periods of loss as well. And so in traditional societies, you have initiation of the elders. And in like West Africa, the person who is going in the process of becoming an elder, who might be one of the more powerful people in the tribe, a chief, and someone who has lots of stuff and, you know, the kind of things that are, we now associate with success, now gets stripped down and covered with ashes and has to live that way for a while in order to be born as an elder for the next stage of life. I'm talking about these things because when you look at the uh, mythology and stories and when you look at the, the kind of traditions of rite of passage and initiation, um, going through loss in order to find a bigger life is the process, not the problem. And so, uh, again, I call it created, created or creative disorder. We are in that period. It's happening to us. 
No one can predict the future right now because of COVID and many other things. Um, and so that whole uh, kind of get a plan and enact it stuff, uh, you know, is not as effective. There's something else trying to be found, going back to the person's question about remembering. We are here now to remember, make members be with us that have been neglected, denied, and uh, refused for hundreds of years. Um, and that includes ways of understanding our own life and how hope exists in connection with the heart as opposed of expectation. Um, can you talk more about the relationship, relationship between the second kind of hope and creativity? I've heard you say that the creative arts are a bridge between the little self and the deep self. I'd love to hear more how that relates to this. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very intentionally connecting hope to imagination. Imagination is, you know, the ground of, of creativity. Um, and um, all of the arts um, were originally in service of the divine. Um, you know, nowadays I know people think we have the music industry and the art industry. That's pretty wild disorientation from the point of view of the heart and the soul. And so um, outside of the industrial kind of uh, invasion of the creative world of art and music and, and all and healing, um, which is a, now a profession or even an industry, the medical industry and so on, um, we're all really invited to be on these paths of creativity. And so uh, I, it's hard for me anymore to imagine being alive without being creative. Um, I mean, when I was younger, um, I was told stuff like, well, you can be an artist or you can have a life. If you're going to be an artist, you're going to be poor and you'll probably go crazy or else you can have a life. And then it turns out that that other life is the one that'll get you crazy. <laughs> I'm joking. But... Um, once, any time we get connected to our own heart and our own soul, we are going to be creative because of the underlying dynamic of, um, of creation, uh, that we are living in creation. We are children of creation. We are the creatures of creation. And, um, and we're supposed to be here creating in our own way so that the person who loves to cook and in their kind of cooking puts love into the food, that's an artist. You know, that may be a chef, but it's also an artist. And so everybody has their natural, inclined ways to be creative. Um, and the idea isn't to be, to win the contest and be the, the voice or, or something like that. The idea is to become an awakened, evocative version of oneself. And going back to the story I was mentioning about the old woman and the unraveling and the revisioning of the garment of life, um, we're each naturally set up to find our own thread, the life thread. I call it the genius thread, the create thread of creativity. And when we align with that and we follow that, we're automatically creative. And I'm, I mean, that's the case for the healers and that's the case for the people obviously in the arts, but it's also the case for the scientists. Many of the ideas behind, the big ideas behind science came to those people, the innovators in dreams. Um, and we're all threaded to dreams. And dreams are part of the ongoing creation of the world too. The world is a, is a big dream that's being created every night. Um, so I don't know how much further to go into it right now, but we're all here to find our way to be creative, and that's more pertinent now as everything is falling apart. We are here to help the remembering of what was forgotten and what was divided, and we're help, here to help the recreating of the fabric of culture, the fabric of humanity and human culture. But also, we're in a position, and some people are specifically in a position, to help reweave the threads of the ecosystems. There are people that are born with genius qualities for doing that. 
There are other people whose qualities are going to be for healing or their qualities are going to be for organizing or building community. Anyway, right now, the world needs everybody in a more awakened way, finding their thread and finding a way to help the remembering and the reweaving. And I'm suggesting that that process produces hope of a different order and hope that's connected distinctly to imagination so that the hope becomes active imagination rather than wishful thinking. Um, is the second form of hope born out of crisis, out of the turning point? If so, is crisis born out of chaos? It sounds like a poem trying to happen there. Um, kind of yes. Um, uh, yeah, crisis, one of its meanings is turning point, like in an illness. It could be turning for healing and it could be turning for, for losing health. Um, yeah, I think the second hope is born out of chaos. I think that's what the story about the spirit of hope is about, that Elpis. Her mother is night as chaos, and she's the daughter of that darkness. Um, a na an old name for the human soul was the light hidden in darkness. Um, in order for us to bring uh, more light into the world, more meaningful light, not more incandescent bulbs, but more meaningful light, more light of creation, we have to accept the darkness more and remember the idea of wisdom is wisdom combines darkness with light. What is the role of community in this process of remembering? Um, good question, really important. Uh, I'll restate, I think we're in a collective rite of passage, um, but the community is only remembered through the awakening of the individuals. This is another paradox. A genuine community, a living community, is nourishing and supporting the genius of each individual. And then the genius of each individual is based on the gifts that we were given when we were born. So the proper thing to do with our genius gifts that were given to us is to give them to others. And that is the continuing inspiration, continuing inspiration, inspiration and creative energy for community. So community needs the awakened individuals and the awakened individuals uh, need a community to support them and also to give their gifts to. And I just want to say community has, you know, I'm not talking sociologically, and I'm certainly not talking about people who live near each other simply, that some people think that's community. Community comes from the old Latin word communitas, and it means something so deep happens that it pulls everybody together. And, and, and so people come together and feel the sense of human communing. And in that communing, you feel the sense of communing with nature, which is waiting nearby, just wishing we'd commune with each other. And all of a sudden, you're like back with the people living in nature once upon a time who understood they were communing with the spirits and communing with the animals and communing with the elements of nature and creation. We're trying to find that deep community, which, by the way, cannot be sustained, right? You have moments of communitas. It pulls everyone together. You have a period of community effort and community understanding, and then something comes and knocks it apart, and then everybody goes back into the darkness, and then you're looking for the next moment of communitas. That's the dynamic. It's the dynamic of creation. It's the dynamic of night turning into day, back into night. I'm just trying to say, um, just as perfection is not worth seeking, uh, the idea of a persistent, awakened community um, is probably not possible. It's more like a community that keeps finding its sense of self and its way of being in creative moments that are exchanged with moments of being lost and disoriented. When we live in an uninitiated culture, how does awakening happen? Good question. Um, awakening is trying to happen all the time. Uh, it, you know, the idea, at least the way I get it, is we each came here to awaken to who we already are. So that's trying to happen all the time. 
Um, and so we don't need the culture to be awake to tell us that. We need some people to confirm it so we know we didn't just go crazy. But uh, the awakening is always there trying to happen. The soul wants to transform again and again. Um, and then since we don't have, we really are losing the collective uh, qualities of civil society. It's, it's really happening. Um, I mean, so in so much I wish it wasn't, but it is. Um, and so then, like I'm saying, what do we do when we can't find it outside? We have to find it inside. And then I want to go back to this idea that we maybe generate hope in each other. You know, I remember when we when I first started mentoring and we were mentoring, the whole project was to find ways to mentor young people that were living in the streets, living in the gang life, and were, were homeless or in gangs, or all this kind of stuff, uh, on the real edge of things. And, um, and so one of the big surprises to me was that it wasn't just that we were there to help them. They actually were a big help to us, too. Like, they awakened us in some ways because they were living outside culture. And so it kind of put us all on the edge and a kind of mutual awakening would occur and we would have moments of community. Moments. And that's what we held on to. I still hold on to those. They like live inside me. Um, and so even in the chaotic times, even in the dark times, even in the face of great uncertainty, we can find these moments of communitas. We can find moments of shared awakening. And then you know, we can reinforce those in each other, you know, relate to each other in the ways that we know each of us have awakened, each of us are struggling to be creative, whatever it happens to be. And in a way, I think that fosters a hope uh, between people that doesn't have to be pronounced, but I think it becomes an aspect of what I'm calling active hope. Um, so... Thank you for all those good questions. I'm getting the signal that it's it's time to kind of find a conclusion. So um, this, like a lot of conversations, is a beginning or a place, you know, to find some sparks. And and uh, I tend to just speak, you know, like spontaneously. So um, it's not a matter of agreeing with everything I say. I don't think that would be wise myself. I don't even agree with what I say. Uh, but I think the idea is in the interest of trying to uh, put spoken meaning into the world, some sparks occur. And the idea is to find a spark. And one of the good things about the technology now is you can watch or listen to this over again. So you don't even have to understand the whole thing. Um, and so um, then... I heard Corn said that we were going to be doing a workshop, and I re now realize that workshop, I want to go further into this material. So, um, on the way out, I want a, a couple of little poems. This is Rumi, um, Coleman Box translation. He gives the title as Thirst and the Dream. This is how people live, most people. Sleeping on the bank of a freshwater stream, lips always dry with thirst. Listen, the love of far-off satisfactions keeps you from tasting the real water of where you are now and who you are. The way is who and where you already are. I mean, this is a poem about hope. The way is who and where you already are. It is sleeping in your very being. That which sleeps and wakes and dreams of the sweet water of life that is the taste of the divine in you beautiful you know awakening poem and then this little one from Hafez come this way for the palace of hope has weak foundations and bring some wine for life is built on the wind you know so uh, there's truth in that too and the wind is the element of change and so we're in the midst of great changes. And uh, so last thing in order to honor um, Pandora, the original meaning of Pandora, all gifted and all giving. 
uh, connected directly to the earth, um, and with the sense that the earth is a present energy, not a kind of material object. It's a living energy, uh, and it's trying to give us energy all the time, just as it gives energies to the trees and the and the flowers and and, and the plants and the animals. Um, so people used to have songs for the earth and song to the earth. And um, so in the dark times, um, traditional people would have songs. You could turn to songs. Songs can carry us when we can't carry ourselves. And songs can carry meaning when we can't express ourselves fully. And so it's really helpful to have songs that we can turn to. And this is one I turn to. It's from the Yoruba tradition in Africa. And um, it's a song uh, to the earth. And it, it, it essentially is a prayer saying, Mother Earth, hold us for this world is hard. And so um, in the way that I'm thinking and talking about deep understandings, it's a song about asking Mother Earth to hold us in the hope of creation. Mother Earth, hold us for this world is hard. Mother Earth, hold us, for this world is hard. Thank you. <laughs> 